Um, All right. If I could have the wonderful pleasure of bringing to the stage Miss Ingrid Nilsson. Thanks everyone for showing up. I know there's been a lot of activity this weekend and I'm feeling it too, so I'm excited. And at the same time, I'm still getting over my jet lag a little bit. So um, just thank you so much for having me here. It's a humbling experience and an honor, and especially because Kathy's right there and <laughs> she's kind of my teacher, so. We, we don't want to ignore Kathy, so can we get a round of applause for the lovely Kathy Westlock? It's uh, actually very hard to ignore Kathy. She is on a big screen in the room. Um, I so have a very big head. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I just want to interject also, uh, I've said this to the other uh, ponies and bronies uh, and the other um, panels and, and uh, when I was chatting before and I again want to extend my um, heartfelt sentiments to everybody. Thank you for understanding. Um, please know that I am so, so saddened that I can't be with you in person and my heart goes out to you, but I thank you for your patience on that and I hope we have a great time together, but know that, just trust that I would be there if there was any way possible, even through a cyclone. <laughs> I hope you guys are getting a little bit of sun soon again. I hear that it's still raining there, but um, I'm happy to be with you in this way, uh, regardless, and hope we'll have a great time for the rest of the weekend. So, anytime you're ready, I think Ingrid and I are re ready to go uh, with um, answers to your questions. I know that uh, you and Ingrid actually have a common interest, which I believe is yoga and stuff along that line, correct? Um, I, ha I don't practice yoga regularly, but I do uh, other med meditations, and I've done Tai Chi, and uh, you know, I, I'm a beach bunny and I'm a forest bunny and I just love nature and uh, so I think we have a lot in common that way. Hey, um, so I know because I've promised uh, Ingrid that we'll be able to do a bit of a yoga demonstration for you guys. Is that something you'd be interested in? Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I'm, I'm like Kathy in that I feel like going to the beach or going into the forest or being in nature is meditation and even when you, I was talking to Megan about this, like when you do something that you love and you get really into it and you kind of um, get absorbed by it and, and really focus on it, I think that is meditation as well. So um, actually in terms of a yoga demo, Matthew, that will be part oh. of the closing ceremonies. Oh, is it the closing uh -huh. ceremonies? Oh, wow, okay, um, there but you go. I would like to, if you are up for it, and you can let me know in a moment um, if you would be open to doing a little breathing or a little med meditation with me. Are we Anybody? all clean? I believe the crowd, they do look ready to breathe. <laughs> I'm ready. Okay, okay. great. <laughs> Thanks, Kathy. Except On your I lead. Say one thing, though, sorry to interrupt you guys. What happens if fire comes out of my mouth? Uh, then we get a fantastic letter from Celestia, I believe. <laughs> Okay, okay. <laughs> it's all natural. <laughs> it's all natural. It's organic. <laughs> so organic. Um, so the reason that I got into meditation um, is actually primarily from working in the film and entertainment industry. Uh, I said this in the first panel, but it does come with uh, its highs and all of the elation and um, awesomeness of doing what you love, but also in a fast-paced industry, it can have its stress and anxiety, and so I came to yoga at a time when I was in a feature film with Molly Shannon and Hilary Duff and, and some people that you may have seen in Hollywood, and, and I found it quite stressful. Um, and so uh, I started going to yoga, and, um, but what's really stuck with me is this meditation, and anyone can do it anywhere, and we kind of tap into meditation through breathing, and who here today has thought about their breath? Put up your hand if you've thought about your breath. Okay, so you're already pretty much on your way. I go through days sometimes where I'm like, uh, uh, why am I so stressed? And then I'm like, oh right, I am not breathing. I just forgot to breathe. And um, I think that a lot of times we kind of just get into the moment and maybe in like an intense situation, we forget to breathe. So what I would love for you to do right now is just take a really deep breath through your nose and exhale through your mouth. Take another couple breaths like that where you just kind of sigh out. Even you can make a noise, it's not weird. You can be like, ah. 
Ah. Uh, rarity, rarity, rarity. <laughs> Can't help it. It's okay. Okay. Oh, great. I love that we're all doing this together. And, um, and now if you could close your eyes, and ever so slightly, not very much at all, just bring your chin a little closer in towards your chest. So like, not fully, but just like a little bit closer. And then just notice your breath through your nose and devote all of your attention to your breathing. And you can close your eyes just so it doesn't matter what anyone else is doing. And see if you can refine your attention to such a degree that you maybe feel your heart beating. Maybe you can feel a pulse in your hands or maybe feel your heart beating in your chest. Rarity. And now, as you breathe a little bit deeper, so some deeper breaths, I invite you to pause for a count of three once you've inhaled all the way. And once you've exhaled all the way, also pause for a count of three or longer, even if you like. So if you're able to retain your breath. Not to an uncomfortable point, but just to a point where you pause at the top and the bottom of your breathing. Stay with your breath and take a couple more breaths just like this where you pause at the top and you kind of float there and you also sustain for a moment at the bottom of your breath. And now just a few more moments. Return to your natural breathing and don't worry about the pauses. Keep the eyes closed and just notice your natural breath and start to feel if there's any tension throughout your body. So scan your whole body Feel if it's in your jaw or your face, maybe like me in your shoulders and neck. And start to feel all of the tension as you breathe, kind of melting or crumbling or falling away. And in your jaw. And for the last few breaths, pretend as though you could open the pores of your skin and breathe through your skin. So you're breathing with your whole body. Final deep inhale breath. And start to just Bring your head back up, sitting upright. Open and close your eyes a couple of times and just see how you feel. Just check in with yourself. Yeah, and if you want to stretch a little bit, go for it. I'm, um, I'm interested to hear from you if you feel anything at all. So maybe, Matthew, you can take into account anyone who wants to raise their hand and if you feel anything, just a couple of people. I would like to know your experience. I am ridiculously relaxed now. Personally, yeah, I felt like actually fantastically <laughs> react, relaxing. I've got uh, a gentleman up here. How do you feel after that? Well, I've actually done, um, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but um, the reconnection with Eric Pearl. And when I've done, I did that, the breathing, it just felt a lot like that, like fully relaxed, fully, the palms of my hands were tingling. Just a good feeling. So Great cool, sensation. Lehan. Thank you for sharing. Oh, we have a hand at the back and a hand in the front. I'm going to start with a hand at the back. Raise that hand again if you can. Oop, I think that hand might be gone. Oh, there it is. After that, do you feel much more relaxed? I can feel the force. You can feel the force. <laughs> That's cool. I was <laughs> feeling your cosplay yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> It's just you. I like it. And then at the front here, how do you feel after experiencing that? I feel great. I think it's, not, it's actually it seems like a great thing to do at the end of a, towards the end of a convention to try and sort of loosen everyone up. Everyone up. So thank you very much. 
Thank you. Definitely. I think we actually do need to give a round of applause for uh, <laughs> just walking us through that. I, I'm applauding you because thanks for going along with it. I know that we're like kind of not in maybe the, it's kind of an awkward setting, but uh, you can, in my lineage of meditation, transcendental meditation, you can meditate anywhere, like on the bus or the tram or the train or in an airplane. And I think that to just be able to access your place of calm at any point has been really valuable in my own experience. So I'm grateful to um, share what's been valuable to me. And thanks for going along with it too, Kathy and Spike. I love it. I love it. I think that meditation, as, as Ingrid said, is um, it's in so many different forms. Whatever it is that you love to do, whether it is walking or running or even doing the creative thing, whatever it is for yourself, whether it's working with a computer or doing carpentry or drawing, it's all meditative and I think it connects you to heart and spirit. So thank you, Ingrid. So. Uh... What I thought we'd do is because uh, questions towards the end, I am sure, will be very show-related, we might explore some other things like yoga and other interests and stuff and get to know them a bit as well as talk about the show. Um, so I've been told that Ingrid does a couple of things other than uh, acting and voice acting, and I presume so does Kathy. So what was it that you like to do? Because you told me a couple of really cool things about yourself just before. Um, yeah, thanks, Matthew. I, uh, I also... Um, work in my spare time, which is getting to be a little uh, sparing. Uh, I work as a board member for a nonprofit called Project True. And if you want to find out more about it, you can visit projecttrue.com. Uh, it was actually founded and developed by one of my yoga students, and she's an attorney. And um, what our kind of mandate is, is to promote positive body image and sort of the crisis or like global epidemic of body image issues and eating disorders is surprisingly prevalent and statistics show um, that even on the low end that as uh, few or as many as one in uh, 10 people kind of go through those sorts of issues and I think everyone to a varying degree like has their own stuff. And so um, what Project True does is we help to fund people with $2,000 grants which we awarded recently to three different individuals um, to fund them through treatment of an eating disorder, which the cost of which can be exorbitant and it can inhibit uh, getting proper treatment. So these illnesses can be life-threatening and there is a high mortality rate and it's something very close to my heart that I've experienced within my family. And so I just believe really strongly in it and to be on the board and to help make these decisions and offer this support, um, it means a lot to me. So. That's, that's something. <laughs> Kathy, do you have anything that you'd like to share with the group? I can't talk that. <laughs> <laughs> well, what I will say um, on that note, as far as um, helping others uh, in, in whatever way you yourself can do so, and whatever your talents are, whatever your cause is, your, one thing that I think I wanted to mention is the fact that when we as actors do cartoon shows normally, you don't think of a cartoon show as having much impact generally, um, you know, except to entertain potentially. But as everyone knows, My Little Pony Friendship is Magic has activated our hearts and op opened us all up. And I just want to hail all the bronies who have shared their feelings and their sentiments and reached out by creating all the charities that the bronies have created. And then, you know, that kind of thing, but also just extending yourself to your, your own friends and, and helping them in any way in a day-to-day. -day. Um, but I wanted to share that one show that um, I had done many years ago called Cyber Six. Um, I don't know if some of you have seen it, but anyway, uh, Cyber Six is a part cyber, part human, and she struggles with her human side of herself and emotions and, and such. And at nighttime, she, she battles crime and, and solves the world's problems, so to speak. Well, what was interesting was when the show was over, this was done in a, many, many years ago, I got a phone call from the producer um, of the show and said, there's a family in uh, Windsor, Ontario, that would like to talk to you um, because uh, almost a miracle has occurred. And what it was was um, the 10-year-old uh, little girl that they had was severely autistic and uh, she enjoyed watching television and so they had her in front of the TV and she really took to the show Cyber Six. She was so um, 
entranced by it for whatever reason. Autism, uh, autistic children tend to relate to um, sound and rhythm especially. Anyway, whatever it was, she really took to the character Cyber Six. Uh, so much so that after watching several episodes, and this is a girl who couldn't even put a sentence together. She wasn't able to verbalize. She couldn't speak. Suddenly, she was able to recite Cyber Six lines verbatim. And no one knew how this occurred. It was a, a bit of a miracle. So when I heard that, I, I couldn't believe it. But it led me to think that what we do do can affect us on levels we're not even aware of. And so if intention is there, and intention is positive and good and loving and real, then that's going to be felt by every heart. And I think that's what My Little Pony Friendship is Magic has done. And all of us that have been affected by that want to spread that word, want to share it. And that's why we are 10 million plus strong today. So whatever it is that touches your heart and feels for you, by all means, share it. Lovely words. So, I love um, your purple hair, by the way. Excuse me, I love your purple hair. Center, Thanks, if you're looking at me, to the left. <laughs> <laughs> yep, just, you just, the, the, the guy in, in white. Right yep, there. Oh, there you. You yep. I think it's awesome. It's kind of like, um, same color as me. Uh, so, you know what? That's like, awesome, man. <laughs> he says, you have the best hair of all of the cast members. You know, I've been told my hair just is too perfect, so you know what? <laughs> there we go. This panel has now loosened up. So, that was loosened up. <laughs> <laughs> so one thing I would like to ask, um, because I know that there are a lot of people, there are a lot of people who uh, enjoy acting, want to be in acting, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there's, like, there is a whole long, drawn-out thing of making your way up, but... For you two especially, um, w did you find like there was, um, did you always want to do acting? Was it you, you, were you, when you were like young, you were like, yes, I'm going to do this 100%? Or was it just sort of thrust upon you as a, yes, I, I am suddenly going to do this thing? Um, it was never thrust upon me. <laughs> and voice acting wasn't even in my radar. I didn't even know what voiceover was. I was in, when I was in high school, I did do theater. I performed in the theater performances, um, which was a lot of fun. But I, I honestly stumbled upon voice acting um, and learned kind of on the fly. And sometimes I think that's the best way we learn is when we're actually doing the work. Uh, workshops are good for that, etc. You know, auditions are great for that. It's like a mini workshop. Anyway, long story short, um, I was working for the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation in um, Toronto originally, Canada, and then got a job in Vancouver, BC, Canada. And the host of the show said, you know, you have a really good voice. Have you ever thought of doing commercials or cartoons or anything like that? You know, voiceover. And I said, no. And he said, you know, you should give it a shot. You never know. You might really be great at it. So I thought, all right, well, what the heck? So he helped me put together a demo at another studio. He worked for CBC, but he worked at another radio station. And before long, um, I got myself an agent, and I thought this was a silly hobby, and um, I started to get work. So I thought, oh, that was fun. That was strange. Um, and then it kind of died a little bit, and I thought, okay, I'll, I'm going to do something else in life. I'll just carry on. All of a sudden, I got two different series, cartoon series, and did those and thought, well, that was fun. And then commercials started to come, and then this started to come in that. So I thought, there might be something to this. And so I just continued to pursue it. And every time I tried to further my education and try to get, you know, I was going to go to school uh, and get my master's in uh, either psychology or sociology because I'm interested in those areas. And every time I tried to re-register, I would get something else. So that's how it worked for me. It was quite, um, I don't know, I guess it was kismet, so to speak, but worked hard at it and here I am today. So very unpredictable, but very grateful to be here. <laughs> oh, you got There's a, oh, snap pony in the front row. 
that little pony, that plushie. Yeah, yeah. What she, is that? she made that herself. That's what she does. No way. Very talented. Seriously? Her name is Sarah. What's your company oh, again, Sarah? That's awesome. I love it. I want to hug it somehow. <laughs> it's very nice. It's so cute. It needs a name. Sarah, if it had a voice, what, what would it sound like? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Something like, I don't know. I'm just trying to hear the Australian accent again. That's all I want to do. <laughs> Oh, well, we've got plenty of people with Australian accents coming up soon. But yeah, you're going to hear a lot of Australian accents in the next half an hour or so. <laughs> the way that um, I got into voice acting, kind of like Kathy, was not so straightforward as like, I want to be a voice actor and now I'm going to do it. Um, my parents say that I kind of came out of the womb dancing and I grew up just like, I don't know, before I could walk, apparently I was dancing. So I trained um, at a professional level through, throughout my youth and danced in a company. Um, but along with that, I started to do musical theater, and I was like, hmm, I kind of want to talk as well as dance. And so th that was a good combination. And from there, I uh, got into the film industry and did a number of series and feature films uh, as I moved out to Vancouver from where I started, a small town in a place called Saskatchewan. I was born in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. <laughs> kind My of mother was born there, Ingrid. What? Maybe we're related yeah. somehow. Saskatoonian blood. <laughs> yeah, Toonies. Tune. Um, so uh, from the film industry, I started to recognize that it's very imagistically driven. And that is what it is. But to spend hours every time that you work in a makeup chair and someone primping you and trying to make you look perfect, um, when I found uh, voice as an, as an option and as a method, um, I really pushed uh, my agent to, to, to put me out for things. And I'm so grateful that she did because the first audition that I ever went out for um, ended up being a series that went for four seasons which I don't know if you would see here, but it's Strawberry Shortcake. Yes, we do have short Strawberry Shortcake. And uh, it's it's a really fun show. It's really cute. And Andrea Libman was also in it, as well as uh, Ashley Ball, so you probably know about them. Um, and from there, yeah, it's just kind of been the ball rolling. And it, it is, like Kathy says, it's unpredictable, but I'm very, very grateful for what I do have. And, uh, and I just want to keep going with it. It's become very much a passion. Uh, so when you guys are in the studio recording, I know that there are times where you're alone doing your own lines and then there are also times when you record as a group, yeah? Um, when you record as a group, do you find it distracting to have other people there? I, I Did you say destructive? <laughs> distracting. Distracting. That's the Australian <laughs> accent for you. You throw at each other in fun. <laughs> um, do you want to answer that, Ingrid, or would you like me to... Well, you, you probably have a lot more experience in the studio, but uh, what I find is that, um, that it's so awesome to be working with these people who are your friends and also people who are your teachers and people you look up to or, you know, people like Peter New, which is a whole other breed. No, I love him, but he, <laughs> in the studio with, uh, with My Little Pony, I, they've had to, like, cut before when he's sticking a pencil up his nose and... I can't help but crack up. I'm like, I'm trying to be so serious right now. That sounds about right for Peter New. So uh, I think you just really build off people's energy um, when you're delivering your lines, if you're all in the same room. I mean, of course, it's not always possible. Tara Strong lives in LA, and we record most of the cast in Vancouver. Um, but I love it. I mean, and I'm a social creature, so I just like to be with people in the room. What do you think, Kathy? I agree. I think the energy just compounds when you're with the group. And uh, not only is it fun to be with everybody and it feels like a family, but um, what I find too is when you're doing a prelay, that's the kind of format of recording that Pony is, we do with Pony, where there's all the actors are in the same room and you have an engineer and a director and you're working together. So um, for me, what happens is it actually isn't distracting, but it really brings you together. It pulls you together. and. As a voice actor, your, your hearing sense is so heightened because you have to visualize uh, what the actions are by listening and hearing what they are. So instead of, like, unlike on camera acting where you can see each other, you don't have that luxury. You have to listen. So if um, someone were to pick Spike up and throw him, you know, and then he's hitting the wall, 
<sighs> kind of thing. You know, then I hear the line before of the actor before me going, I'll get you a spike or whatever, and then whatever it is. And then it's like, no, 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 no. And then, you know, and then they're like, I will, I will get you, don't get near me. And if you do, I will throw you across the room again. Kind of thing. And I'm like, no. And like, so all this energy is like, you can feel the physical vibe as you're doing it. And so as soon as that director says, take one, boom, we just all gel together and the intention is like really sharp. And then you're in this kind of world. So that's how I find it. Just quickly, I might just uh, ask on top of that, how much of when you do it like this, how much of it uh, is all together and how much of it is edited together after, after the fact by the engineers? Well, the voice tracks are um, uh, recorded separately, and then um, the animators will draw it to the voice tracks. So we are in there not looking at anything. We know our characters. We're listening. And so the soundtracks will be edited out. There are various takes of the things we say, and then the animators animate to that. Um, so, But the cool thing is that the animators have all this luxury excuse me, and flexibility to make our characters, the facial expressions of the characters, whatever they see fit. Mm -hmm. So our acting dictates for them how they are going to draw our characters. Mm -hmm. So sometimes if someone is like spinning, you know, and you know, they'll do that, or they'll, they'll, they'll do a little smirk, like Spike will go like that, and you know, we don't mm -hmm. know that that's happening, but they put it all together with our voices and it comes out to be something so much fun. So that's why for us actors too, we don't see the show until we see the show fully put together and it's always a treat because then we t it's new for us as well in that way. So yeah. it's a lot of fun. Huh. It is, it really is. And and it's awesome when we can all be in the same room together. It, it, exactly like Kathy says, it kind of compounds and, and builds momentum and energy. Some people are uh, in bands and do other things, though. So in the case of Ashley Ball, she's sometimes on tour with her band. I don't know if you've heard of Hey Ocean. Yep. They're lovely. Um, and so uh, sometimes you'll uh, skip over an actor's lines. And so in that sense, um, yeah, they are put together after because they'll record separately. Um, yeah. So uh, with all that, I think it's now time to hand over to Mysterious Brony to fish some questions out of the audience. Alrighty, people, hands up if you've got a question. I will screen all questions first. So if you want to ask another question yourself, Matthew, while I get a few questions lined up. Sure, now you're putting me on the spot. Uh, that's what I do. <laughs> go, Matthew, go, Matthew, go, Matthew, go, uh, Matthew. The pressure's on. Okay, uh, I know that How Ingrid... about you just twerk? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Did you call him a twerk? He's right. an expert, actually. I've seen it done several times in an expert fashion, and I know that there's a pink skirt floating around. Pink <laughs> 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 skirt floating around? Tell us about that, Matthew. Yes, Matthew. <laughs> okay, maybe okay, we'll spare so you. Uh, All right, so I, I, I do have one question from the audience just to uh, save my friend music, here. If there's music, I can do it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a question for uh, Ingrid. Maud Pie, season five. <laughs> and Who asked that? <laughs> that was this gentleman just here. Oh. <laughs> uh, don't hide. Um, it has been publicly released that there is a Rock Farm family episode. And I'm... <laughs> kind of part of that family. So we're all family here. All right, I got another question from uh, one of our musicians from Arthur Dark. Evdog here wants to know, for people looking to get into voice acting, uh, how would you go about making a demo reel that you would send to uh, various TV shows and such? It's such a great question because I learned from Kathy, so I'll, uh, I'll let her take the reins. My faithful student, Ingrid. <laughs> uh, basically, my, my advice is, um, there's two things. Um, one of the important things is that is to know is that when you're starting out, it's very, very hard for you to hear yourself accurately the same way a casting director would hear you, but you have to start somewhere. So the first thing that I recommend in, in, in moving towards, you know, getting a demo done is to really be honest about your range, 
uh, your capability, and I do recommend getting somebody in your area that you feel is a good, that you find to be a good voice acting coach. You can often find out who the talent, what the talent agencies are in your area, and the talent agencies who represent on-camera actors, of course, as well, usually know who it is in town teaches good, teaches voice acting, good voice acting instructors. So that's a really good way to find out somebody in your neighborhood. Um, and so you can always contact them and ask them, you know, first of all, find out about them. Make sure that they're a coach that's actually working, you know, and who has uh, some, some background behind them, some experience behind them. And when you get to that stage, they'll be honest with you about what they hear your range to be. Because the last thing you want to do is put on a demo um, ranges that you really can't sustain. It's strange, strange your voice or it's very airy, it's too high, too low. And if those things actually get on your demo, the casting director is going to hear that as being, you know, weak. And so they'll just get somebody who can do that. So you want to make sure that when it comes time to do your demo, that you know clearly what your, natural, what your ranges are so that you're strong enough to do that. And that's really important. People want to hurry out there and get their demos made quickly without thinking about that. And I don't think there's any hurry to getting the demo done since it is your ticket, your resume into the industry. How you can work yourself until you get to that point of getting a coach is that you can record yourself and um, sit down and ask yourself, what personas or characters do I think I can do? So if you feel like you can do a great truck driver, you can do a fantastic Pinkie Pie, or you can do a rock. <laughs> or any of these characters, or your brother, or it doesn't matter, an inanimate object even, then start to record that on your iPhone or any other device and start to record the characters or personas that you feel you can do well. Um, and also make sure, and this should be on your demo, that the dialogue reflects the character. So if you're a talking dog, say something about cats, your dog house, yada yada, don't just say it's a sunny day, because that helps the casting person or the listener be able to visualize what you're doing. It gives them a better sense. So, record yourself. Eventually, you'll find a good coach in your area. Um, save up for it, though. One good lesson is better than none, because they'll tell you the, the truth and the shortcuts about what you need. Then when you feel ready and you've done some practicing, and you've had some feedback, then you can think about actually making the demo. So, you don't want to go to all the cost and expense and, and do that route until you've had some some in input into that. It's really important. It's the resume, your resume into the field. And I can see all you guys right now, and you look fantastic. You look awesome. Give her a wave. Yeah. Woo, That's job. actually... And short sleeve shirts, it's driving me crazy, and you have tans. <laughs> <laughs> I, have, I have one quick question before we continue. Um, on sort of related to that is, when you have your voices, do you like make the voice once you get a character? Like, so say, My Little Pony comes to you with Spike and says, and you have the audition for Spike, and then you go, I will create a voice for Spike. Or do you have that voice which you can do and then match it to a character, if that makes sense? It's a really good question. I think basically, um, after you've done this for a little while, you understand the different areas of your range that would apply to the character that's in front of you. So if I got a brand new audition and I can see the picture, because any actor would just go for the picture first, that's almost enough for some of us. We need words, of course, but the picture is the first thing an actor wants to see. Um, and then when you look at that picture, then you get a sense of, okay, so he's a little boy, you know, he looks really innocent, he looks roughly this age, and then you start to shape it. Or he's a teenager, and I'm not going to go too high because my range doesn't go, it goes to a certain limit, and I'm talking just about the boy. And then I start to expo explore and expand. So you learn as time goes by, this is the character, ah, it could be one or two or three of my voices, and I can alter them slightly. And then you make a choice as the actor, and then when you go to the audition, you let the director help you to continue, yeah, a little younger, give me a little bit of rasp in that voice, more energy, and then it's shaped together. So you make a choice first. Um, it's kind of a combination thing. When you're, when you're new at it, it's a little bit more difficult. That's why I recommend recording the voices you feel you can do and make it a, a, a running library, a voice library for yourself, and either name it with a name, 
a quality, raspy guy, high-pitched woman, or a title, mom, teacher, student. That's how you'll condition yourself when you go in for an audition. And to tag on to what you said, Kathy, that's been one of my biggest um, learning tools is uh, in, along with recording yourself, like really listening and hearing where like, oh, my, my pronunciation there was not accurate or what I said there isn't what the character would say. And so when you really tune your ear, then you start to just drop into these characters and you can kind of start to riff as them. Um, and what I, one of the things I learned from Kathy too that was really helpful was this idea that it's not just the lines, it's the sounds, like when Spike was being thrown against a wall and all of the things that you can do to bring it to life, whether it's like the laugh of the character, huh, 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 <laughs> or you know how they cry or how they fight. Um, that's really important because in a lot of the work that we do, it's not just static lines, it's, it's action and it's movement and it's, it's life. And I'll, I'll add to that too, Ingrid, you're tweaking more things that I wanted to say about that now. And that is that you have to, when you're doing voice acting, even if it's commercials, it's a different ball of wax, but still it's voice acting. You're a person. You're not just taking lines or words and shaping them into a read. You're a person relating to a person. So in animation, no matter what character you are, if you give yourself a sense of the setting that you're in, that will give you a sense of physicality in your performance. Um, so visualizing that's important. Also, if you come up with a new voice, the best thing to do, and Ingrid, this is, I, I can't even stress this enough more and more as I go along my own career, ad lib in the character for a while. Ad lib, get off the dialogue, don't work the lines too much, don't do anything, just get a general gist of the picture and start ad libbing whatever that would be, knowing you're the character. Ad lib, ad lib, ad lib, ad lib. And then when you get to the dialogue, then you, you, you go to the description, ad lib more, then when you get to the dialogue, it's only what you would say. And you're easily directed. The same goes for commercials. Read over the commercial first, get a sense of what it's all about. What is the product and service? What is the tone of the piece? What Kathy am I? Am I the one who works for the Cancer Society? Am I the mom who just bought the car? And now I'm just gonna relay my message. You can shape it in certain ways. There's other rules and regulations, but ad-libbing is a wonderful thing and getting a sense of where you are in the scene. Get physical with your acting, and it, it's really helpful and it's successful. On the uh, the note of ad-libbing, just because it's a good uh, good segue, we did have a question from over here in the, the white shirt next to the fantastic horn about, uh, um, about how much of your work is improvised, uh, especially to do with, it was the Clousedale National Anthem, was it? Yes, and then yeah. just, just a side note for a question on the end of that, uh, a very common one that you get at probably most cons, if you could play any other character in the show, who would it be and why? Well, I mean, all in fun, I like to play the other characters, but the ones who have the characters do the best job <laughs> of the character. I love Fluttershy. I could never in a million years do Pinkie Pie because Andrea is not even real. So <laughs> she's an she's a entity in herself to have that little bubble in her voice and be so energized. Oh my God, it's amazing. So the closest I could get would probably be other than Princess Celestia um, because that's a natural voice range, um, would be um, Fluttershy. So Fluttershy, I really love animals, yay. And then the other question was to do on how much of your work is improvised? 98% um, is not improvised. Uh, that's a sign of really good writers and good writing. The part that would be, quote, improvised, and in fact, that's not the really the right term because we do have to stay true to the script. The only thing that you can play with is the actions, reactions, and maybe a cough or a smile or some kind of, uh, you know, just a <gasps> Or sometimes I would throw at the beginning of my line, yeah, look, um, blah, 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 instead of just the line. Or, okay, so, you know, that kind of thing. But other than that, you have to stay true to your lines. All righty, we got one for uh, Ingrid. When you are uh, voice acting, do you find it easier to do a monotone voice such as Mon Pai, or do you uh, find it just as difficult to do that as any other type of voice acting? That's a good question. Um, it's kind of the 
a two-prong answer, actually, in that uh, in terms of how much energy it takes to voice Pinkie Pie, that is actual expended energy. So when you're like talking at a high um, pitch and at a fast rate, um, it's just like an opera singer will sing an opera and they have to like have a meal at intermission because you are putting so much energy out there. Um, so Maude in that way kind of conserves energy because she isn't all over the place uh, and as crazy um, <laughs> as Pinkie Pie, uh, who I love. Um, but then in terms of the, the work that it takes, uh, it does require me to be quite focused and, and that requires a concentrated energy, so a different kind. Um, and it's not that I prefer one or the other, like a very monotone or kind of flat character or one that has a lot of variance. Uh, it's just a different type of focus and energy. When it comes to your energy and stuff, um, I know that I've asked other voice actors this, but I suppose it's particularly true for Andrea with Pinkie Pie. Do you guys like move about and sort of have the physical aspect as well when you're voice acting? Because it's not just limited to your voice usually, is it? Oh yeah, I'm flailing all around with most characters, um, except but Maud. except Maud, where I stay <laughs> as still as possible, and I try not to move because that's just she's not really that into flailing. Spike is. <laughs> On the note. Uh, yeah, oh, yeah, sorry. Spike. Um, I just wanted to say that the funny part about Spike is I never know what I'm going to get. I don't. I never know what predicament that guy's going to get into. So, I never know that till I get the script, and then we just go on the fly. And and because Spike's um, uh, his expressions are so different than the other ponies. I mean, frame by frame by frame by frame. It's hard for me to know what the directors have in mind versus what I'm giving them. So it can change, it can it'd be an absolute match what I try to do with Spike and his spatial expressions or his energy. It can be a match to what the directors want or it can be something completely different and yet still get the line across. So we're always kind of working with that kind of thing, at least in my character. Uh, on the same sort of vein of energy, uh, we had a question from this side of the crowd just asking whether, when, when you're creating your voice, do you find that you do need to be a lot more uh, eccentric, like 10% more eccentric with the way you do it, or 10% less eccentric than, say, for, uh, a standard speaking voice? It's a, it's a good question, because um, in the early days of Mel Blanc and those sorts of things, the energy was really, really high in those days. Now, I find there are so many ranges of performance for animation, it's not funny. I mean, if I start talking like this and I'm going, oh, you know, this is really weird and I'm kind of scared and oh my gosh, <laughs> this kind of thing. Or I'm just being a human being drawn character talking like this and just having a normal voice. Um, it can really be, it can really change. But then the character can also be drawn very eccentrically and then you just have a flat voice or a soft voice or whatever. There's one character I like to do and uh, here's what she sounds like. And she used to uh, run a fish market in one of the shows we did. And uh, <coughs> uh, you have to throw those kinds of things in there. And uh, that's just kind of weird. I love it. <laughs> um, my <That's> understanding. <laughs> I don't know if you guys have heard of um, Larry Moss, an acting teacher who wrote a he, was, he coached people like Hilary Swank and Leonardo DiCaprio. Um, and he has this book called The Intent to Live. And what he talks about is that acting, any kind of acting and voice acting included, is this um, living, it's, it's reality under extraordinary circumstances. So it's, it is reality, but heightened. And so I think with any character that you play, it, even if it's a real delivery, there's the, your senses are heightened, you're highly attentive to you know, the, just the method of, of how you're um, delivering the character. I think that just to, yeah, to be an actor in any sense requires a lot of awareness. Um, but then also a, a lot of times on the breakdown, it'll include things like we want a really, like no cartoony voices. We want a really realistic read. And so then there is still that heightened sense, but you really kind of do bring it down a little bit. Um, and, and so less cartoony, but then, yeah, you get all sorts of like crazy um, cartoony voices and then you really have to, to bring up the energy. So 
my Poison Strawberry Shortcake was like a little girl, and she was always kind of laughing and looking at butterflies, and sometimes she gets distracted. So, yeah. All right. And also, too, the, the writers, um, the eccentricity can also be in the writing um, rather than just in the voice performance. So, um, you know, that combination can be magical, too. So we had another question, uh, just in a comparison kind of sense, what's, uh, how different and what is it like working for Pony as opposed to other things that you've worked for, such as Strawberry Shortcake and your many, many, many things that you've done? <laughs> My Little Pony, um, it's interesting because as you all know, there have been so many versions of My Little Pony as well, right? So um, the thing I love about this version of My Little Pony is it reminds me of the stories of my own childhood, the quality back then, where it was very heartfelt, very real, um, very, um, everyone could relate to it because it was <clears throat> universal that all of us had dilemmas and troubles and um, disappointments, uh, one being this weekend for myself as well. And, uh, you know, having to live through that and having to work through that and, uh, you know, come to terms with different things in our lives. And I think My Little Pony, it isn't even so much the performance as a voice actor, but it's, it's getting to be a part of a show that's relaying real life things in an inclusive and compassionate way. So for me, um, the show is, it brings me back to the old morals and values of just connecting with other people. And I think we miss that in society today very much. I think that's what's attracting us to each other. It doesn't matter what our differences are, but every one of us has a heart and we connect that way. So that's what I love about the show. That's what's unique about this one for me. Others have similar qualities, but this one has everything. That, the animation, the writers, everyone's committed, but it's all about heart. I love very that. Sweet. And in, in terms of the range of, of different characters, I mean, Kathy's kind of runs the full gamut. Um, I recently have started playing more um, kind of villains, which I really enjoy um, because we all, I think we can play into that side of ourselves. And so in an upcoming Barbie movie, I'm the mean Barbie uh, at band camp. So I'm like, um, hey guys, can we skip this, the sappy sing along and get, to, get back to work? We've got, a re we've got a rehearsal here. Um, so things like that uh, can get to be a lot of fun. And um, yeah, I think that just to be in a, a range as an actor is fulfilling to explore this diversity that's within you. So that's one thing that I really like about it. <laughs> I think that's where the challenge lies too when we get these characters um, that we get to audition for. They're so different and sometimes they take you out on a limb and you think, but me, a villain or whatever, and then you go, oh, because if you have a very big, deep voice and your man say, the stereotype is to use that big voice and, you know, bruh, scare, right? But there's also creepy, you know, and there's uh, kind of cool, calm, collected, and unpredictable. So there's all kinds of different levels. And I think that it's great for Ingrid and I to have a chance to be able to dig in and see what we come up with. All righty, we got a question from some of our younger audiences. Because uh, you were saying before, there are so many amazing characters on My Little Pony with such uh, in-depth sort of characterization. Do you have a favorite? Have you ever picked a favorite that you'll just, you've decided, that's my favorite, that's my fun, that's the pony? Uh, you know, I, I always have loved Fluttershy, if you're talking about the main six. I've always loved Fluttershy because I'm a bit of a sentiment, I'm a very much a sentimental suck <laughs> and she loves animals and nature and that's kind of me too and um you know she could gain a little bit more confidence and that's why i think it would be awesome if uh spike and fluttershy could end up in a situation together where they have to fend for themselves that would be so cool um background characters wow there are so many well i'm just happy to have had the chance to play coco pomel which i um was was really uh taken by when 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 she uh, she did so well and i'm allowed to say i'm allowed to give a spoiler as well that coco pomel will have her own episode in the next upcoming season Whoa. and who knows um i'm looking forward
forward to maybe doing some more designing. I hope all of you can be there with me. I love some of your costumes tonight. <laughs> And again, I'm going to kind of tag on to Kathy here and say that I adore Fluttershy. I have a special place in my heart for animals and nature. Um, in terms of more of a, it's not really background pony, but I can't get enough of Granny Smith. She's <laughs> <laughs> oh, like, Granny Smith, eh? So tell me, Ingrid, why don't you and I do a dialogue of old people right now? Uh, well, um, uh, uh, but, uh, but, uh, but, uh, but I can't can, can, can compare to, uh, to, 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 to Tabitha, because uh, but, but she's, uh, well, she's quite special. She's very special, and we are her relatives, of course. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but, 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 but who, who, who are we? It's been so long since I could, could remember these things. Well, my dear, that's because you're getting a touch of Alzheimer's, but that's all right. I can uh, understand that. Oh, the, the, the olden days, I used to remember all sorts of things. Now I can't remember my name. That's all right. You stick with me, and we'll walk through the apple orchard together. <laughs> Let's do that. That actually had a really sweet ending to it, too. <laughs> that was very nice. Uh, we've got a question for, for you, Ingrid, about um, how do you juggle your yoga instructing and your uh, voice acting at the same time? That's a great question. Who asked it? Put up your hand. <laughs> uh, thanks, Joseph. Well, um, it's interesting because Kathy was saying in the panel that she did earlier that um, the voice acting that we do can be fairly unpredictable, so there's nothing very linear or you know nine to five straightforward about it. Um, I get contracts where sometimes I'll you know have auditions or multiple auditions every day for a week, and then sometimes it's more quiet, and sometimes you'll have back-to-back -back sessions on a day. Um, and so I can always get my yoga classes covered, but a big part of why I teach yoga. Um, in addition to sharing something that's been really beneficial to me is that personally I find it helpful to have a set schedule and to be accountable um, on, a, on a kind of a time basis. So I have to be in this place at this time. Um, also the teaching schedule that I have kind of accommodates people in business or just with the nine to five kind of job. And most um, gigs that you have in voice won't be, uh, will be during that time of business hours. So then I kind of teach in the evenings or at noon hour or early in the morning. So, um, and I have cut down my teaching quite a bit because I am working more and more. So I went from teaching like 20 classes a week at one point, which was insane, to more like um, 10 or less than 10 classes a week, so, yeah. So you have to increase your own yoga. Yeah, you have to make time for your own personal practices, whatever that is, and but yeah, if I teach too much, then I start to go crazy. How, how do you make time for anything with yoga teaching, voice acting, and the nonprofit? You know, I've always liked to have a full schedule, um, and and so if, if I'm doing what I love, then it doesn't feel like I'm working or struggling or busy. It's just I'm in this kind of ebb and flow of what I love, and so I feel fueled and, and kind of fulfilled by that. Um, and, yeah, I think that it is really important to take down time, and I, and I have to kind of schedule that in these days and time to relax and to put your feet up and to, to chill out. I think our, you can't kind of underestimate the value of that um, because it's sort of when your mind get a chance, gets a chance to reset and your body can relax. So I'm a fan of relaxing. <laughs> so am I. So am I. And I think what's, uh, what's interesting about what he was saying too is I think it's really about finding the flow in your life. So if you're doing a job that you enjoy, it doesn't even really feel like work. You know, it feels like an extension of what you want to give to the world or what you do well. So that's not really work. But of course, you can be enjoying yourself too much <laughs> and uh, exhausting yourself. And I think, uh, I think we, uh, we underestimate how important rest is as well in whatever way, shape, or form. So do what you love to do and go for it. But I think getting some rest and making sure you get that is really important because spirit needs that as well as the body. All righty, we've got another question right from the front here for you, Kathy. Uh, your favorite spike moment ever? Oh, awesome, man. Hey, I like your 
shirt, you know, it's really beachy and like really Australian and stuff like that. And I don't know, I, I gotta get one of those. It's real colorful. Thank you. What's your question? Uh oh, can't hear you yet. Hold on. What's your favorite spike moment in the show? There's so many. I, I loved when he said, rude yet. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite spike moment, I have so many. Well, of course, the, the Cloudsdale anthem. Yes. Oh, it's really great to be here in the Gold Coast on Spike. <laughs> well, I hear that it's kind of windy too. Oh, wait a I, I gotta change my key. Um, 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 um. Well, it's really great to be here on the Gold Coast, even though I am on Skype. <clears throat> but well, it's kind of windy because there was a cyclone, but, and I think it was a lot of hype, but really real. <laughs> It, it was putting poor Spike on the spot when he had to sing, but the other one that kind of takes the cake for me is when the poor guy had to light the torch. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, those were two of it. And his little back and forth with Al Aloysius. You know, it was like, <laughs> Spike, uh, number one assistant, mm. Spike, mm. <laughs> love that. Oh, it's a very good spike moment. <laughs> All right, so we've got time for just one more question, and I think it's actually a rather good one. Uh, it's for both of you guys. When it comes to plots that you like to work for, do you prefer comedy plot or moral plots? Oh, Ingrid, what do you say? Well, I think that uh, with a lot of the shows, including My Little Pony, especially My Little Pony, there is this moral and kind of... Uh, like ethical framework into a comedic story. So Megan was mentioning earlier in the writer's panel that um, she often comes from a place of like having something to say. And I think that's really valuable because a story has to have something that drives it. And Jillian could probably speak to this better than I, I don't know. Um, but within that, I think uh, My Little Pony does a really great job of uh, maybe the storyline that's driven that has this kind of framework, has these really comedic um, plot points and moments. And that's something that I really love about the show is how I always get in a laugh. And often that comes from a place of tension when the story is mounting in this way that you, you know this tension kind of drives the comedy. And so I think that they kind of go together and that's part of the consideration in, in making the stories, but I'm not the writer, so you'd have to ask Megan. <laughs> No, a great answer. Um, I, I, I think that My Little Pony Friendship is Magic is all about morals and values and being real and connecting to each other and including everyone. Uh, and um, so the, co the comedy is the color to me in each of the shows. And you know, sometimes we're in pretty tough spots in our life. And sometimes you have to say to yourself, you know, and here comes a little philosophical quip, but this is what is, align thyself. Sometimes you don't have control of things that happen in our day to day, and it can be seemingly very tragic. But in the end, you know, what I do is I tend to look at the good things and what I'm grateful for, and that boils down to some of the basics. So My Little Pony covers all of that, and that's why I think it's successful. So. And the writers are awesome. The morals and values, the letters to Princess Celestia in the end are very touching. And um, the comedy is, is crazy. It's just so great to be on a show where you can voice that as an actor. All righty. Thanks a lot. We'll head back up to uh, Matthew McKenna on the stage now. So I think that's a very lovely note to end the uh, panel on. So. I would like to get the biggest, most amazing screaming round of applause for the wonderful guests that we've had here today. On the count of three, one, two, three, go!
Thank you so much, Epiphony. Um, you have warmed my heart, and this has been so special for me to just connect with you, and I thank you for the honor for being here, even on Skype. In fact, Spike said something to me. You know, it's kind of weird, because you know how my name is Spike and everything, right? But lately, like in the last couple of days, people have been starting to call me, like, Skype. <laughs> Thank you so, so much. Enjoy the rest of your holiday, holiday, those who come in, and a con. See you, Kathy. Thank you so much, everyone. Love you, Kathy. Love you. And thank you so much, Every Pony, as well. Uh, it's just been an absolute joy to spend this weekend with you and to uh, get to know some of you a bit better and just to, um, to just have conversations and to share this space with you. And your country is amazing. And I, too, could listen to your accent all day. So come <laughs> talk to me. I want to listen. <laughs> Goodbye. One more round of applause as we finish up.